myself when I did that. And I have since been restored to full health. I was abused at home by my family for many years. My parents are Jehovah's Witnesses. And um, I left the religion when I was 14. I'm not mentally ill anymore. I'm not a danger to myself or others. If I could change it or if I could take it back, I would. On August 28, 2013, a brutal and horrific crime shocked the community of Aurora, Colorado. Not only was the crime horrific and the scene a bloodbath, but the aftermath of this crime is what rocked the community. There was social media fame, tons of TikTok videos made about this killer and this case, and just a huge outpouring of division, really, from the public on who was guilty, should they be reprimanded, what really happened, what was the truth. So we are going to talk about all of it today, guys. Hey guys, I'm Annie Elise. This is 10 to Life. Let's jump in right now. Today's video is sponsored by Rocket Money. Did you know that 34% of women say that their finances keep them up at night at least once a month? That is really scary and really upsetting to hear. And I'll be honest, I am one of those women. But fortunately, those sleepless nights have become much less since I started using Rocket Money. Rocket Money is an all-in-one personal finance platform that helps you save more and spend less. Rocket Money is trusted by 3.4 million members and counting. Now, Rocket Money has helped me save and manage my finances in so many different ways. One of the easiest and main ways it's helped me is by canceling unwanted subscriptions. Rocket Money safely and securely identifies reoccurring charges and cancels unwanted subscriptions with just a tap. You know how it goes. You sign up for something like a free trial, but then you forget about it and end up being charged every single month until the end of time. Well, no more. Last month, I was able to get rid of three subscriptions that I didn't even know I had. They also have helped me lower my bills. Simply by uploading a photo and tapping a button, Rocket Money can negotiate your bills for you, from internet service bills to cell phone bills and even dreaded cable bills, which honestly is just so great for me because I really hate confrontation and negotiations and I avoid it at all costs. To try it out for free and unlock even more features with premium, head to rocketmoney.com slash 10 to life or click the link in the video description. It's so easy and really has helped me so much. So make sure to check out rocketmoney.com slash 10 to life to start managing your personal finances today. Born in June in 1995 in Aurora, Colorado, Isabella Guzman was the only child of her mother, Yunmi Hoy, and her father, Robert Guzman, who devoted all of their attention and focus to her. When Isabella was four years old, her parents, Yunmi and Robert, got divorced for unknown reason. Subsequently, her mother married a man named Ryan Hoy, which may have been a trigger for Isabella's difficult behaviors in the following years. This led to a troubled relationship between the mother and the daughter. The fact that her mother had moved on from her father and found love with another man was a significant struggle for Isabella. She felt that Ryan was attempting to replace her father. And at the age of seven, Isabella's mother reached a breaking point and made the decision to send her to live with her biological father, Robert. And I think she was sent back shortly to live with her mother again, though it is unclear. Reportedly, both Robert and Isabella's mother struggled to take complete control of their daughter's challenging behaviors. Isabella was a difficult child all around, with terrible tantrums and frequent fights with her parents. Isabella was brought up in a Jehovah's Witness faith, which is a particular branch of Christianity. However, at the age of 14, she made the decision to leave the religion, which led to a variety of issues between Isabella and her parents, which we will delve into in a bit later. According to family and friends, Isabella exhibited problematic behavior from a very young age. She frequently engaged in fights and arguments with other children, she disliked attending school, she struggled with poor grades, and she harbored a strong dislike for most things. Apart from that, there is not much information made available about Isabella's childhood. 
When Isabella turned 18 in 2013, her behavior escalated to a completely new level, causing an increase in tension between her and her mother. Furthermore, Isabella wanted to drop out of high school despite being very close to graduating, which added to the household's already existing tension. Which, I mean, this was undoubtedly frustrating for her mother, as she was just a few months away from finishing her studies. Like, just pull on your big girl pants at that point, tough it out for a couple more months, graduate, get your diploma, and then you can go off, gallivant, be an adult, and do whatever it is you want to do. In addition to the tension with her mother over dropping out of school, there were also problems with Isabella sneaking boys into the house. There was even an incident where a neighbor had to call the police because men who were her boyfriends were jumping over the fence of her home and it looked suspicious. In late August of 2013, there was an incident with one of Isabella's boyfriends. Although the reason for their breakup is unknown, the ex-boyfriend went to her house to retrieve some of his belongings. However, something happened during that exchange, and Isabella chased after him with a golf club. Big red flag, now things are starting to escalate and get a little bit scary and little signs of violence are beginning to emerge. During this time, Isabella's behavior towards her mother and stepfather was becoming increasingly disrespectful and even threatening. According to Ryan Hoy, her stepfather, their personalities clashed, and they never really got along. From the jump, it was always a very hard transition for her. He reported that what was happening during this time period, though, was different from what they had experienced before. Isabella had always been difficult to handle, but her behavior was now on an entirely new level, and more extreme, as if something had suddenly changed within her. It had gotten so bad at one point where an incident occurred during an argument with her mom where Isabella aggressively spit in her mother's face. Now, this was obviously a turning point in their relationship. It was a clear moment of disrespect, and it was a moment that left her mother, Yunmi, feeling shocked, hurt, and scared even. For a mother, seeing such behavior from her own child can be incredibly distressing. It was a stark reminder that something was not right and it left her feeling vulnerable and afraid, to the point where she even asked her husband Ryan not to leave her alone. From that moment on, Yunmi was constantly on edge around her daughter Isabella. She never knew when the next outburst would occur or how extreme it would be. She was constantly walking on eggshells, trying to avoid triggering her daughter's explosive temper. It was a difficult and exhausting situation for her to be in, and it took a toll on her both physically and emotionally. On August 28, 2013, the tension between Yunmi and Isabella reached its peak, leading to the tragic events that unfolded that day. The day began with her mother waking up to a series of threatening emails from her daughter, with one message ominously declaring, you will pay. The contents of the emails are unclear, but it was enough to send her mother into a state of panic. She was scared for her safety and didn't know how to handle the situation with her volatile daughter. She was faced with a difficult decision, but ultimately knew that she had to take action to ensure her safety and the safety of those around her. Reluctantly, she made the decision to call the police, hoping that they would be able to at least scare her daughter and bring some stability back to this tumultuous situation that they were in. The arrival of the police was a glimmer of hope for Yunmi, as she hoped that their presence would help to de-escalate the situation and start to help reason with Isabella. The officers performed a welfare check assessing the situation and attempted to calm the tension between the two. The officers took the opportunity to speak with Isabella and informed her that because she was now 18 years old, her mother had the legal right to ask her to leave the house if she continued to cause chaos and threaten her. After the police left, Yunmi had to go to work, leaving her troubled daughter at home alone. As she went about her workday, she couldn't help but worry about her daughter Isabella and the possibility of her unpredictable behavior. So with a heavy heart and mounting concerns, she made the decision to reach out to Isabella's biological father, Robert, for assistance. In a desperate plea, she requested Robert's help in talking to Isabella, hoping that her daughter would be more receptive to her father's words than she was to hers. Despite their past differences, she recognized that Robert could be a valuable ally in this situation, so she hoped that his involvement would make a positive difference and that he would be able to reach Isabella in a way that she simply couldn't, since their relationship seemed to be better than her relationship with Isabella. 
So on the afternoon of August 28th, Robert arrived at Yunmi's house to have a heart-to-heart conversation with his daughter, Isabella. He knew that he had a difficult task ahead of him, but he was determined to make a positive impact. As they sat down to talk, Robert stressed the importance of respect in any relationship and the need for communication to be conducted in a very calm and mature manner. To Robert's surprise, Isabella seemed responsive and appeared to be taking his words to heart. So Robert was optimistic that he had made a breakthrough and that Isabella was finally starting to see the error of her ways. However, the situation was far from over. As events would later unfold, Robert's conversation with Isabella would prove to be just a temporary reprieve. These deep-seated issues that plagued their relationship were too ingrained, and things would take a dark turn later that day, leaving everyone who knew this family in shock and disbelief. Once Robert left, Isabella retreated back to her bedroom, where she remained for the rest of the evening. Yanmi returned home from work around 9.30 in the evening, carrying McDonald's for dinner. She asked her husband Ryan, who was sitting in the living room at the time, where Isabella was. Ryan responded that he had not seen her, but assumed that she was in her room. So Yanmi decided to take a shower and left Ryan downstairs eating his McDonald's for dinner. Shortly after Yanmi went upstairs to take a shower, Ryan was startled by the sound of thumping noises and his wife screaming out his name. Instantly worried, Ryan ran upstairs to investigate and what he saw left him a bit confused for a second. The bathroom door was wide open and the shower was running, which he found odd because Yanmi usually closed the door when showering. He saw Isabella standing in front of the door closing it with his wife Yanmi inside. Ryan tried to intervene, attempting to enter the bathroom before Isabella could lock the door. However, Isabella proved to be too strong and succeeded in locking the door with just her and her mother trapped on the other side. The intensity of the situation had escalated dramatically, and Ryan was left feeling helpless outside of the locked bathroom door, uncertain of what was happening inside. The events that unfolded in the bathroom left Ryan in a state of shock and disbelief. He couldn't bear to hear the sounds of Yunmi's screams for help, and in a moment of desperation, he knew he had to act quickly. He dashed downstairs to grab his phone and dialed 911, praying that help would arrive in time to save his wife. As he made his way back up the stairs, Ryan's heart sank when he saw a pool of blood seeping from under the bathroom door. Yunmi is still in the bathroom screaming at this point and manages to scream out one last word before everything goes quiet. And that word was Jehovah. Ryan is standing outside of the bathroom when the door unlocks and slowly creaks open. There stands Isabella drenched in blood and wearing a pink sports bra with turquoise shorts. In her hand, she was holding a knife in a downward position with blood dripping off of its blade, creating a gruesome and chilling scene. Ryan was frozen with terror, not knowing what had happened to young me or what will happen to him. But to his surprise, Isabella walks towards him, in silence, not even looking at him. It's as if she doesn't even notice his presence and just walks right past him, leaving Ryan in a complete state of shock and confusion. As Ryan entered the bathroom, his wife Yunmi was laying on the floor, still and lifeless, with a baseball bat next to her. The 911 operator's voice was in his ear and it was a lifeline in the chaos of that moment. Yunmi's eyes were open, staring blankly at the ceiling. Despite the fear and the uncertainty, Ryan tried to focus on the task at hand. He followed the operator's instructions to perform CPR, and emergency services arrived just 11 minutes after Ryan's initial call. This was at 10.16 p.m. The speed at which everything had unfolded is staggering. Despite the efforts of Ryan and emergency services, young Mi was pronounced dead at 10.28 p.m., It's difficult to comprehend how quickly her life was taken away, especially considering she had just returned home from work less than an hour ago. She had no idea that within an hour of returning home, her life would end. The suddenness and the unexpectedness of her death only added to the shock and horror of this situation. It's a reminder that life is fragile and can be taken away at any moment without warning or explanation. The impact of her loss on her loved ones is immeasurable and would be felt for a very long time to come. The grief and confusion that they must have experienced is unimaginable. 
and the details of what took place behind that locked bathroom door were just about to be revealed and it would just completely shock everybody. The investigation into Yunmi's death was undoubtedly complex and required a very thorough examination of the evidence. According to the autopsy report, Yunmi had sustained a staggering 79 stab wounds to her face and neck, with a slit to her nose as well. And I just want to say the sheer brutality and viciousness of the attack from her own daughter, her own flesh and blood, is difficult to fathom. It is believed that the attack began with the use of that baseball bat that was found lying next to her mother's body. It appears that Isabella may have started with the bat, using it to bludgeon or weaken her mother, before then switching to the knife and proceeding to inflict 79 stab wounds. It is truly heartbreaking to imagine the pain and the terror that Yunmi must have endured during this savage attack. Dale, when we first got here just after 10 o'clock last night, we talked with police. They said they were waiting on a search warrant before they could go inside. When I got here at 4 o'clock this morning, I did see a few officers uh, coming in and out. So it looks like the investigation has started. I'm going to step out real quickly for you, show you what's happening here. This is the house in question. This white house here, you can see the yellow tape blocking off. And they've also got the road blocked off as well. And you can see several squad cars still in the road here. Let's give, a, uh, give you another look at this suspect. Isabella Guzman, 18 years old. This is the woman police are looking for. They were searching for her everywhere last night. They even used the help of a, the Denver police chopper last night. They did a reverse 911 to homes within a one and a half mile radius searching for this woman. Here's what we know so far. Just after 10 o'clock, police got a call on what was supposed to be just a family disturbance. That's what police thought, and they were caught off guard when they arrived. They said a man greeted them at the door and told them that there was a woman upstairs with apparent stab wounds. Police pronounced the woman dead on scene, and then the search was on for Isabella Guzman. Again, she is still on the loose. Police looking for her as we speak. She is named a suspect right now in this case. And of course, the investigation is still ongoing, still very active here. And of course, we're going to cover this from start to finish throughout the morning, and I'll be here for it. After discovering the gruesome scene and realizing that Isabella was the prime suspect, the police wasted no time in launching a manhunt to locate her. Ryan, desperate for answers and justice for his wife, had informed the authorities that he believed Isabella had fled to the backyard. The police quickly scoured the area searching for any trace of her. Unfortunately, their efforts were in vain, and Isabella was nowhere to be found. As a result, the authorities decided to release her images to the public, warning people not to approach her under any circumstances, as she was armed with the very same knife that she used to brutally murder her own mother. The fact that she was still at large with a deadly weapon in her possession sent shivers down the spines of the entire community. Despite their best efforts, the police were unable to locate her. They even tried to track her through her cell phone, but to no avail, it had been turned off. The search for Isabella continued, with law enforcement officials on high alert hoping to bring her to justice for this heinous crime that she had just committed. The day after the murder, the police received a call from an individual who reported a car with a dead body inside of it covered in blood. The police quickly responded and headed toward the parking lot where the car was reportedly located. However, upon arrival, they found no sign of this dead body. While searching the car in the parking lot, the police discovered some of Isabella's personal belongings, prompting them to suspect that the blood-covered body that was seen inside the vehicle was none other than Isabella sleeping, still covered in her very own mother's blood. At around 2 p.m., the police received a sighting of Isabella right outside of the parking lot where her car was found. The police quickly closed in on that location and apprehended her for the murder of her mother. A week after being arrested for the brutal murder of her mother, Isabella made her first appearance in court. The atmosphere in the courtroom was tense as people tried to catch a glimpse of this young woman who had committed such a brutal crime. As Isabella was escorted into the courtroom, all eyes were on her. Some people were shocked by how young and how beautiful she looked, while others were disgusted by the fact that she could commit such an atrocious act. The judge read out the charges against Isabella, and it was clear from her facial expressions that she was not taking the situation seriously, not at all. Her smirk and lack of emotion only added fuel to the fire of public outrage at the time. 
However, just recently, a clip of Isabella's courtroom behavior went viral on TikTok. And before you knew it, there were hundreds of edits of her all over TikTok of people actually sensationalizing this monster. Trends went around of people trying to imitate her behavior and make the same facial expressions that she was making. And this captured viewers on TikTok because of how beautiful she is. And most of the songs used in these TikTok videos was that song, Sweet But Psycho. Yeah, she's sweet but a psycho. You know, that one I'm not going to sing because you definitely don't want to hear my voice. And don't mind the fact that this case gets any attention because of the sheer brutal murder of her poor mother. Let's give her attention and fame because she makes cute facial expressions and she's a pretty girl who doesn't look like somebody who would normally would commit murder. That, my friend, is the definition of privilege. You commit this heinous murder, then you get famous on TikTok, people talk about how beautiful you are and how shocked they are, people are making spoofs and knockoff videos of you. The generation that we're living in and the generation of younger kids, guys, it's truly scary. It's truly, truly scary. So she had to attend her first court hearing to be formally charged with her crimes, and Isabella was actually kicking up a fuss before this hearing, like refusing to leave her cell. And the whole court hearing was actually delayed by quite a bit. But when she did finally arrive for court, that is when she displayed the most bizarre behavior that we have all seen now. Upon entering the courtroom, Isabella's demeanor was unsettling. She immediately caught the attention of the camera and many people were taken aback by her facial expressions. Isabella's sarcastic smirk and lack of emotion during the hearing left many people feeling disturbed. As the hearing progressed, Isabella directed her gaze directly at the camera, which some interpreted as a sinister gesture. In one particularly strange moment, she pointed to her eyes, leaving people wondering what her intention was behind that gesture. Some speculated that she may have been trying to show that she was not crying. Upon viewing the videos of Isabella, it's hard to ignore the childish behavior that she displays. It raises the question of whether or not she fully comprehends the severity of the situation that she's in or not. On the other hand, some may argue that her lack of remorse and disregard for her actions suggests that she is a psychopath. Which I'm curious to know, what do you think based on this footage? What's your gut telling you? Cold, calculated, not remorseful? Or a true socio or psychopath? Isabella was detained without bond, and almost a year after she brutally murdered her mother, her court date was finally approaching. As the trial drew near, the defense team submitted a plea of insanity on her behalf. This was not entirely surprising, as Isabella had recently undergone a thorough medical and psychological evaluation and had been diagnosed with schizophrenia. The defense was arguing that due to her mental illness, Isabella was not capable of fully understanding the gravity of her actions at the time of the murder. In the period leading up to the murder of her mother, it was evident that Isabella's mental state was rapidly declining. Over the course of approximately a month prior to the murder, she began experiencing hallucinations, delusions, and imagining the presence of characters that did not actually exist. Now remember that boyfriend that she chased with the golf club. He also recalled that she had been talking to him about a mysterious person named Sam, who allegedly hated him. He had no idea who Sam was and believed that this person might not even exist. It's possible that Isabella's deteriorating mental state had caused her to imagine this Sam character, adding to the list of her delusions. She also began referring to her mother as Cecilia, when obviously that is not her name. Isabella had become convinced that her mother was actually this Cecilia person and that killing her was necessary to save the world. The prosecution considered the possibility that Isabella was not in a sound mental state during the attack due to her recent diagnosis of schizophrenia and her deteriorating mental health in the days leading up to the murder. As a result, both the prosecution and the judge accepted the plea of insanity submitted by the defense before the trial started. This ultimately led to Isabella being found not guilty by reason of insanity. Isabella's case was far from typical. Instead of being sentenced in the traditional sense, she was transferred to a mental state hospital, a place where she would reside for an unknown period of time. The decision to institutionalize her was made in order to ensure that she was no longer a threat to herself or others. It's been approximately six or seven years since Isabella was admitted to that mental state hospital, and since then, there has been a little to no news about her condition or her side of the story. HIPAA laws, which were enacted to protect patient privacies, have kept her medical and personal information confidential. After years of silence and speculation, 
Isabella made a bold decision in November of 2020 to speak publicly about her experience and finally share her side of the story. Isabella felt that it was finally time to share her story with the public. She wanted to explain what had led her to her institutionalization as well as share her thoughts and feelings about the experience. She also wanted to show that she was ready to join society once again. I was not myself when I did that, and I have since been restored to full health. I was abused at home by my family for many years. My parents are Jehovah's Witnesses, and um, I left the religion when I was 14, and the abuse at home worsened after I quit. The fight with my mom was terrible, and um, I was injured in the process. I have the scars on my hands. Um, I don't know if you can see or not. I'm not mentally ill anymore. I'm not a danger to myself or others. If I could change it or if I could take it back, I would. Isabella made shocking allegations of long-term abuse by her own family. She claimed that the abuse began when she was just a young child and continued for many years, becoming worse after she left the Jehovah's Witness Church at the age of 14. Despite the gravity of her claims, there is no concrete evidence to support them. While Isabella's allegations cannot be dismissed outright, it is important to approach them with a degree of skepticism, as false accusations of abuse are, unfortunately, not uncommon. That being said, it is also important to remember that many survivors of abuse do not have physical evidence to support their claims. Abuse can be emotional and psychological, leaving no visible scars or marks. So it's kind of a tough line to walk, which let me know if you think she's being honest about this or not. Isabella expressed profound regret for her actions and the person that she was at the time. She revealed that she doesn't even recognize the individual she was at the time. It's unknown if she's going to be released, as there's no information on it at all, but I highly doubt that she will be released anytime soon. She's only been in there for six or seven years, and she committed, honestly, one of the more brutal attacks that I've heard of to her own mother. And judging based on other similar crimes where people were found not guilty by reason of insanity, she will likely be in there for a long time. In 2014, during her stay at the hospital, she was allegedly assaulted sexually in a closet by an employee of the hospital. She reported the incident to the hospital's police in 2015, and while the Colorado Department of Human Services also investigated the case, the details remain private. She stated, He asked me if I wanted to go in there and look through to get some clothing, so I did. The other patient left and he went in there and shut the door behind him. I was afraid that if I didn't do what he wanted that he could ruin my life. She stated that she was planning on prosecuting the employee for the alleged assault and was traumatized by the event. However, the district attorney's office asserts that they were never forwarded the case by the hospital police. Yet Isabella held on to the case, and in early 2021, she met with the district attorney's office to seek prosecution of that alleged assaulter. But she was informed that the hospital's report of the incident made pressing charges difficult. Moreover, the six-year gap of time between the initial filing of the report and the pursuit of prosecution made things even more complicated. Following the office's suggestion, Isabella is now in contact with the nonprofit organization, American Civil Liberties Union. This is to take legal action against the hospital employee who assaulted her. In June 2021, a judge ruled that Isabella would be permitted to leave the hospital for therapy sessions that involve group therapy and additional forms of treatment. Nevertheless, she is required to wear a GPS tracker for her public outings so that her whereabouts can be traced. The fear that her mother felt that day is something that no parent should ever have to experience. It's hard to imagine what she was going through and what was going through her mind as she read those threatening messages from her own child. The events of that day were a culmination of years of turmoil and conflict between this mother and daughter, and the situation had finally spiraled out of control, along with severe mental health issues. In the aftermath of that day, many questions remained unanswered, but what is clear is that the tragedy that occurred on that August day in 2013 was a devastating blow to both the family and the community as a whole. The case of Isabella is a prime example of how social media can become a breeding ground for misinformation and false narratives. During the course of the investigation and trial, there were numerous rumors and inaccurate accounts circulating on various social media platforms. Many of these rumors and false accounts were extremely damaging to the mother's reputation, and they had a negative impact on the public's perception of the case. 
People seem to think that just because a random user said something in a TikTok comment that it must be true, which I hope, if anything, this video will shed more light and clarity to the events that actually took place. I'm interested to hear your thoughts in the comment section. Should somebody diagnosed with schizophrenia who stabbed their mother in the face 79 times be allowed freedom once they are rehabilitated? Can someone be rehabilitated from something like that? On one hand, the rehabilitation of individuals with mental illness is a critical aspect of the justice system, as it can provide necessary treatment and support to help individuals recover and reintegrate into society. However, the severity of the crime committed and the safety of others must also be taken into account. Ultimately, decisions regarding the release of individuals who have committed violent crimes must be made on a case-by-case -case basis, taking into account a range of factors, including the severity of the crime, the individual's mental health history, and, of course, the risk of future violence. It is important to note that the criminal justice system is designed to balance the need for punishment with the need for rehabilitation and reintegration into society. While there may be no easy answers, it's crucial that we continue to explore ways to support the rehabilitation and recovery of individuals with mental illness, while also ensuring the safety of our communities. It's a very fine line, and I'm curious to know if you believe that the mental health is to blame in this situation. Did Isabella truly hear voices, and was she coerced by these voices to do this? Or was this something more deep-rooted, deep-seated, and evil because of the tumultuous relationship she had with her mother for years? Was it her finally reaching her boiling point and acting out? Let me know what you guys think in the comments below. Thanks so much for tuning in with me. I hope you appreciate the case coverage. If you want to make sure that you don't miss any other case videos that I upload, make sure to hit that subscribe button really quick below. It's completely free, but it will subscribe you to the channel. So when you open YouTube on your phone or your computer, you'll start to see my videos populate so that you don't miss any of them. All right, guys, thanks so much again for tuning in. And until the next one, stay safe.